This will change everything. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. Our lead story today, a top banking insider now admits that the unthinkable is coming. And when it comes to banking, right now you have a choice. You can have your money spread across multiple banks. When you want a loan, you can shop multiple banks. But when you see what is coming down the pipe, it will change how you bank forever. But before we get to that, we have an update on what's going on with China's property sector as they attempt to kick the can further down the road, and we're going to make the case why it's not going to work at all. And if you're wondering what we're doing at the Federal Reserve today, well, one of the most important reports in terms of policy making came out, and it suggests now that perhaps the Fed will have to further hike rates that we expect to hear them say next week. But will they be completely wrong as inflation comes down? Well, that's the case we're making today. And we also have a sponsor for today's show. You may remember the Glimpse Group, a virtual reality company. Well, they're back and they have one of the most interesting chart setups that you could imagine. For those of you who are technical traders, you might be familiar with the inverse head and shoulders pattern. Well, we're, we're seeing here is a major setup that could bust the shorts and send the stock train as much as 22% higher. We're gonna make that case later into the day's show. So stay tuned or check out the pinned comment or description for more information. Now let's head over to Bloomberg where we picked today's story up with a headline. Country Garden pays interest, extends the $1.4 billion of bonds, and this is the case that we're making of the what we're calling the extend and pray plan because you're going to see more and more companies come out and say, you know what, we can't pay our bills, but I tell you what, if you can extend the terms of this and perhaps maybe say some prayers while you're along the way, it will all work out because what's what we're going to continue to see is the hope that the global economy is going to turn around and that the problem has been this entire time that companies just need a little more time and it won't be just companies you're going to see even consumers asking for an extension the problem and the case that we're making is if the global economy doesn't turn around then all of these extensions are really for nothing Developer earlier won creditor support to extend repayment on a 10.3 billion yuan or about 1.4 billion of local bonds, a significant respite that cuts debt due in the coming months. Now, this is a very simple deal. They're acting like they won creditor support. Well, when you owe about $1.4 billion, it's really simple. You own the bank. In this case, they just went to the creditors and said, look, here's your options. We're either going to outright default or you're going to give us an extension. Here's our financial. Financials. So you can see that if you want to get paid, we want about three more years here. And sure enough, after a little bit of trouble, the creditors realize it's better to extend than go to bankruptcy court. Holders of the securities voted in favor, of course, no surprise, of the company's plan to stretch principal repayments by three years. The results leave just about $2 billion yuan of principal and interest for local notes with maturities or put options remaining in 2023. And of course, their shares jumped by up to about 2.8%. And this has taken us now into the inflation story. This from the Wall Street Journal. As U.S. inflation accelerated in August as gasoline prices jumped. Now, as we get into this, you know, we have to understand that inflation generally does not move in a straight line because supply and demand does not move in a straight line. But what we saw coming in the late part of the summer are some very important factors, one of which was the demand for gasoline as we saw late summer travel pick up. And we kind of noted in a prior show that this was likely to feed back into the CPI a little bit, but would not over the longer term change the overall trend, which is a continued deceleration in consumer prices with the potential for an outright contraction. Let's dig a little bit deeper here. The Consumer Price Index, a measure of goods and services, also of supply and demand, across the U.S. economy rose 0.6% in August, which is rather high. That from the prior month, a faster pace in July as gasoline prices jumped. 
Prices rose 0.3% when stripping out the volatile categories of food and energy, a hotter pace for so-called core inflation than the prior two months. Keep in mind, it's the core inflation that the Fed's now fixed on. The uptick in core prices reflected higher costs for such items as rent and vehicle insurance and medical care. Now, many of you in the comments noted that your vehicle insurance, your car insurance went way up. And of course, these things are eventually going to show up as we're seeing now in the consumer price index. But the challenge is you start looking at you know, rising prices is there is sort of a lag where things do catch up into it. And then once they hit, they don't move a whole lot more going forward. So the idea that we're going to see a further push in rents and in vehicle insurance is probably not that likely. Now, maybe over the next couple of months, but over the longer trend, we should see those cost increases start to smooth out. On an annual basis, prices overall were up 3.7% in August versus 3.2, which is going to, of course, we're going to hear about from the Fed next week. While core inflation, again, this is the one, at least for now, until they change their mind, edged lower to 4.3% in August from 4.7% the prior month. Now, the question is, we have know the Fed's fixated on the core inflation. Of course, we also know the Fed changes their mind month to month. If they are fixated on core, what we're likely to hear from them is a potential pause next this next week with the notion that there are still more hikes to come of course we're going to make the case while any further hikes are being unlikely and unwarranted but as we look at the data today, we can see here is the U.S. regular formulations for gas price on a year-over-year -year basis. This thing jumped higher, but notably, I want you to see it didn't have that much of an effect on the consumer price index because what we're starting to see now is more disinflation from other parts of the consumer price index start to matter here where the energy sector isn't pushing up as much as it did in the past. And Fed officials signaled last week they were preparing to hold interest rates steady at their meeting next week, and Wednesday's inflation report isn't likely to change that outcome. Whether it's enough to lead officials to raise interest rates again in November or December largely depends on whether inflation firms up in the coming months. Now, why this matters is because this report by the Wall Street Journal was written by none other than Nick Timorous, who we know is the inside track on what's going on with the Fed, not to mention we look at interest rate futures or the Fed fund futures in terms of what the market's ex expectations are, and they're not pricing in a hike either. So you look at these two forces, you have, of course, Nick with the inside access, the federal funds rate of Wall Street things, and generally, as a rule of thumb, the Fed never wants to disappoint Wall Street. Now, time to time they do, but overall they don't, setting us up for what is likely next week, a pause. Again, as I've said, they're going to stress and probably suggest that there are further hikes warranted. Of course, they'll always be data dependent. While slowing price increases across several categories earlier in the summer were a sign that the Fed has made progress in cooling inflation, as if the Fed has some magic tool to do that, and if they did, well, you can see it's not very effective. The central bank is like a football team trying to punch in a score after a long drive. You still have to cross the end zone, and that can sometimes be the hardest thing to do, especially when you start to realize that monetary policy has no effect on consumer prices, even though that that's what the Fed wants us to believe. So yes, punching the ball in the end zone at this point is going to be difficult because further rate hikes are probably not likely going to matter. But there are some other factors of why did we see inflation pop this month? As many people believe that this may be the beginning of a resurgence in inflation as we're about to make the case. Well, there is a factor of why, and it wasn't just because of gasoline prices. The big challenges we look at is supply and demand, and here we see the consumer price index, this in blue, on a year-over-year -year rate change against the personal savings rate. So what we can note is that consumers, uh, up until this last month, have really been increasing their savings rate or trying to rebuild their savings, and at the same time they started doing that, or shortly thereafter, what happened, we see demand come down in, of course, the slowdown or the disinflationary effects 
as the consumer price index slowed. And then what happened this last month? Of course, we saw the consumer price index rose, which gets everyone excited, including the policymakers, that perhaps the genie is coming back out of the bottle. But really, what you notice here is the consumers drew down their savings. This came after, of course, we saw consumers maxing out their credit cards. We saw consumer credit for the first time decrease. And so what this suggests is the only remaining question is how long do consumers continue to draw down their savings? Well, with the pandemic stimulus almost gone or perhaps now gone altogether and student loan repayments starting next month, I'm going to say the odds that consumers are going to continue to draw down their savings to spend is probably not going to last a whole lot longer, if at all. An important question is whether step down in price pressures that begin in June will be sustained. And the answer is yes, it will because the consumer is tapped out of money and they have new bills coming back online. Not to mention, of course, we'll get to the banks here in a bit. But the Fed officials are wary about being head faked by a couple of months of lower inflation because the rate slowed at times in 2021 and 2022 only to accelerate. And I want to point out here that in this article, it says the official Officials are wor wary about being head fake. And I want you to understand the fact that they would be wary about it suggests that they do not even understand the monetary system or the financial system or what causes inflation to begin with. They are absolutely clueless because if they did understand this stuff, they wouldn't be head faked. And they then that would make a whole lot of sense. But here's the evidence there won't be any head fig, at least not, of course, to what we expect from central bankers, because indeed there is something that is a factor here, and that is the creation of new money. And we know that consumers love to borrow money they don't have and buy stuff they don't need. It's called credit, and in a debt-based economy, it is that expansion of credit that creates the demand that leads to inflation. Here we see the consumer price index still shown in blue against the net percentage of domestic banks tightening standards for commercial industrial loans to firms of all sizes. Now, back in 2001 here, if we go back and look, we can see the consumer price index did head fake a little bit before it came crumbling down, only after the banks had sufficiently tightened and kept lending standards tight. Of course, what happened again during the global financial crisis, which of course we do know that the CPI accelerated to the downside because oil prices came down, and here we see it happening again as banks tighten standards and restrict the credit creation mechanism of our financial system well demand goes down along with inflation so the notion here that we're going to see a head fake would only likely be if consumers continue to draw down their savings where we're going to make the case that that's highly unlikely to happen because without the cushion of the pandemic stimulus money anymore consumers are going to face more higher bills and of course, the resumption of bills and the chances that they're going to continue to draw down their savings as they fear perhaps the economy slowing, I'll say is highly unlikely. The average price of a gallon of regular gasoline was 384 in August compared to 360 in July. Of course, that drove the year-on-year -year rate higher, and higher gasoline prices reflected oil production cuts by Saudi Arabia and Russia, among other factors, which we could also argue was increased demand from U.S. consumers who are traveling more. But that will change, generally does, as we get back to school season here, and some firming of overall price gains this summer could be a bit of a blip in long-term softening trends for inflation, I'll make and say, I agree with that completely. With the cooling in the labor market, consumers in the coming months may feel more economically challenged, which could ease spending and support a further slowing in price increases. And that is absolutely true because if consumers start to think that the labor market is softening and they're going to be starting to worry about their jobs, which they would, and the simple reason is if they're getting less hours and yet they're still getting a pay raise, so their total compensation continues to slow well you watch their spending is going to slow as well as far as food prices meanwhile they rose 0.2 percent in august on a monthly basis the same pace as in july and energy and food prices heavily influence how many americans view inflation because they spend a lot of money and time buying those things and that can affect their behavior including the wages they demand from their employers the problem is employers without inflation can't continue to give out big raises. 
And yet we still see wage gains feed through to services prices, or at least that's the myth that's going to be perpetrated going forward as senior Fed officials have focused attention recently on a subset of prices for labor intensive services by excluding food, energy, shelter, and goods, which we're making the case that's a lagging effect, and this is not uncommon. And officials think that category could reveal whether wage pressures are passing through to consumer prices, especially because they have expected price increases for housing and goods to slow. Well, what the problem is, is we've gone through this extended period where total compensation now show as average weekly hours multiplied by average hourly earnings of production and non-supervisory employees that shown in red on a year-over-year rate of change has been been leading the demand side or the consumer price index down. Now, for the first time in a couple months, we've seen that go over the line where total compensation is now slightly leading consumer price index. But in history shows, that's not enough to change the trend, particularly when you see credit being tapped out and the savings rate out already historically, fairly historically low levels. And in the past, we know that these declines in total compensation growth lead to less inflation, not more. We tend to see inflation only when total compensation is outpacing price growth. And then, of course, we see demand going higher. And that is, of course, the full circle of what we need businesses to have to drive prices higher. They need their price empowering to go up to pass it on to their employees. But as we talked about in the beginning of the show, how you bank is about to change in the future. This from one top banking insider. Let's over to the Wall Street Journal. Almost all loans are bad and why banks aren't lending. Now we know why banks aren't lending. We're gonna go through this again because it's very important to understand. But when you see a headline that says all loans are bad, well, what do banks do? How do banks make money? Of course, many people think, well, they make money on deposits. Well, they don't make enough money on deposits to have all the branches and staff. They're really, their money maker is in lending side. And if you're starting to hear from banking insiders that loans are bad, well, it tells us that how we bank in the future is going to change dramatically. But right now, their lending is expanding very slowly as the latest Federal Reserve weekly tally overall loan growth at U.S. banks has been 3.6% on an annualized seasonally adjusted basis so far for the third quarter. Some of that reflects weakening demand for loans, thanks in part to rising interest rates that have made it much more expensive to borrow or buy homes or cars as well as for companies to finance themselves. It also reflects credit caution in some sectors, such as commercial real estate, where landlords are mostly empty offices office buildings might struggle, might, to cover their higher cost of new loans. Of course, it's always about interest rates, but really it's about tightening lending standards. Here again, we look at that net percentage of domestic banks tightening standards for commercial industrial loans against commercial industrial lending in red, that on a year over year rate of change. No surprise when banks tighten lending standards, they originate fewer loans. It has nothing to do with higher interest rates, but everything to do with the bank's restricting the creation of credit by restricting the amount of loans. And here you can see it once again, very clearly in yellow, that line, the commercial industrial loan growth heading lower and about to contract. And yet, even if the economy were to stay strong and consumers and businesses were to increase their appetites for borrowing, it wouldn't matter because banks don't want to lend. As we see here, banks might still be reluctant. Of course, they're reluctant because the yield curve's inverted. And that's because banks will still be worried about ensuring the stability of their deposits, both to satisfy investors and regulators, or they'll be dealing with rising capital requirements from a new set of Federal Reserve proposals. And the answer is really the fact that the yield curve inverted and banks lend at the long end of the curve and borrow at the short end of the curve. So if they lose money lending, well, of course, the only way they can make it up is on origination fees. But otherwise, if they're losing money, well, they don't want to lend. And sure enough, that's the factor we see here when the yield curve reaches near inversion as shown any point uh, close to or below the horizontal black line. And lo and behold, banks start tightening lending standards. And sure enough, we see that over and over again. So it's not an issue that rates are higher. It's the problem is that rates are inverted. 
And for now, some banks have described themselves as being on a diet as they become much more selective about the risky lending and financing they provide. Speaking at a Barclays banking conference this week, there was a common message. Attractively priced loans will be for the best customers. And so now you're seeing kind of the onset of how banking is going to change because you have to answer yourself, what is a best customer? Well, you're about to see it's not exactly what you think. Citizens Financial said our pace of growth here will be guided by our ability to drive a strong deposit profile, fixating on getting money into the bank, and we will not be offering out our capital, or get this, we're not going to lend money to you and loans to those who don't fully intend to bank with us and enter the relationship business, translating to, you don't give us all your deposits, we ain't giving you a loan. And if you think that's going to be different than the other banks, it's not. There's going to be a big competition for you to start bringing all of your business into one bank. And it won't be just the fact that your deposits are there. It'll be where are your investments? Are you are you putting them through our brokerage firm or through some company we own? Are you going to use your car insurance with a company that gives us a kickback or your homeowner's insurance? They're going to start looking for all kinds of other revenue sources to the point where you're not going to be able to shop around because the other banks are going to say, unless you move all your business, you're not getting a loan. And that's been validated as you're about to see here. Even the biggest banks are feeling the pressure, as B of A said it had higher capital requirement levels and it would have to evaluate things such as how much of the unused credit card lines it can offer, suggesting it will cut credit limits. And J.P. Morgan Chase Chief Executive Jamie Dimon said the new set of capital proposals by the Fed will imply that certain things should not be held in the banking system. Get this, that's what it means. Almost all loans are bad, he said, meaning that the banking system is no longer going to be about loans, but about services and getting deposits in. And this is a bad sign because when you think about you know, why we need commercial banks to originate loans, we need them to create new money. And to create new money creates economic growth. And and if the banks are so highly regulated to the point where they become deposit institutions, you're going to watch the economy for the decades to come grow so slow, you won't believe it'll look a lot like Japan. And the evidence that that's already happening is here is mortgage demand stalled at a level not seen since 1996 as applications decreased for the seventh time in eight weeks, reaching the lowest level since 1996. But one thing that we think is gonna reach a new, a recent high here is our sponsor. That's the Glint Group. They're on the NASDAQ under the symbol VRAR. Here's the case of why I think their stock could pop 22% or more. And here you can see based on their chart setup, this is a beautiful bottoming pattern being built here. I want you to just get the picture. There's a left shoulder, a head, and a right shoulder here forming. There is the neckline. A breakout of that takes it up to about $3.99. We see the RSI is moving higher, as well as the MACD suggesting that momentum is building. And that move from the price this morning is about 22%. Let's take a little bit deeper look here. Again, symbol on the NASDAQ, VRAR. There's your left shoulder. There's your head. There's your right shoulder forming. You can see the neckline right around where the 200-day moving average is, that tan line. You break out there. You see the sellers are very adamant about getting there. You break out of those short sellers. And next thing you know, you're seeing a pop right up there to likely around the $399, maybe low $4 price level. And let's zoom in a little bit more because you can see the sellers right here valid validating that this is indeed a reversal pattern. You can see them here sitting right at around $3.30 selling anytime price gets up there. Once those sellers are worked out, watch for a break of that neckline. And if you measure this chart, it's about 50 cents and that validates of it going right up to where it needs to get, or a little over 50 cents, where we see, of course, that move, that 22% move to the upside. As always, with any company we feature on our show, you're under no obligation to purchase their stock. Be sure to do your own research before placing any trades. And with that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.